Welcome to Purpose 360. I'm Carol Cohn, and today more than ever before, companies, brands, and their partners need to stand for something beyond the bottom line. I've created this program to provide insights and ideas to share with you so that you can apply them to your work the very next day. The goal here is to uplevel your purpose and to benefit companies and society. So please join us. to tell you how excited I am about our conversation today with Coralie Kenna, who's the Director of Global Communications and Public Relations for Patagonia. I could barely sleep last night because Patagonia to me is just one of the most extraordinary companies in the globe. And you know, they're mythical. Um, you know, we when we're talking to current clients, potential clients, and we always say, who do you admire? And absolutely, in 100% of those questions, the answer is Patagonia and Unilever. And so, um, also, I have to say that um, this is an amazing story because it's a story about lived values, a scaling philosophy, an urgency about our climate and the planet. I'm going to talk about the numbers, because I always do that when I introduce. But normally it's about the revenue, the employees, the amount of offices and such. And sure, Patagonia was founded in 1973 by Yvonne Chouinard. And I have to tell you, in my earliest days, I, I represented Gore-Tex and Thinsulate, and I was, you know, active outdoors. And so, God, Yvonne was like a god to me. Um, The company has grown to over a billion dollars. They have over 2,200 employees and 37 retail stores. They were a B Corp as soon as they could in California say, we want to join 2012. But that's only the beginning. And I have to tell our listeners and also Corley that um, we always find other numbers. and. Here's a truism for Patagonia. When you see their other numbers, they have a lot more than it's about the profits. So let me give you a few. They have raised and donated over $104 million um, to support environmental and social work since 1985. They have funded $7 million given to frontline indigenous and marginalized communities scaling. They have funded over 1,082 environmental groups that have received a grant in the last year scaling their actions. They are the number one company in fair trade support. They touch over 49,000 lives of workers who are getting a fair wage. Tremendous impact there. I love this number. 82 activists within Patagonia are trained in terms of grassroots activism. And then talk about walking the talk. The company also has a fund, a bail fund, to get these guys and gals when they're doing civil disobedience in an appropriate way, because they've been trained, they give them bail and they also get them legal support. Um, they've done 10 short films, um, w- which we'll get into. They have had over 2,275 free community events in their stores They have had over 100,000 pieces of clothing through their WARN program, uh, truly repaired. And then I also, here's a great number, zero. A zero dollar that the employees have to pay into their health care. 
So I, I hope I have um, embarrassed you a little bit, Corley, because these by the numbers tell the story. A company that truly lives its values. So Corley, I know that was a long introduction, but welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you. Corley, you have a great background. And so I'd love to hear a little bit about your journey. And also then you got this job at Patagonia. I think there are probably at least a thousand people that want your job. (laughs) So talk a little about your journey, because I believe your career has been leading up to this moment. Yeah, you know, I, I feel really lucky that I'm in a role that does pull from my experiences um, every single one of um, my professional experiences, truly going back to uh, my very first internship, um, which uh, was with um, the late, great John Lewis. Um, he oh, be, oh, yeah, oh, he had that's incredible. To be my, uh, was my hometown congressman. And um, so when I was a senior in college and uh, or approaching my senior year of college and trying to think about where I should intern and what I should do, um, a lot of signs kind of pointed to um, taking advantage of the fact that a real uh, civil rights hero was my hometown congressman and maybe he would take me as an intern. And so I applied. I got it. I loved it so much. I went back to University of New Hampshire, graduated early and went straight back to Capitol Hill. And uh, that kind of things took off from there. I uh, worked on Capitol Hill. I worked on some campaigns. I got into the field of um, campaign research, um, which uh, is often split into kind of two categories. There's the opposition research, the dirt diggers, as they call them. And then there's the (laughs) self-research. There's understanding what your candidate has ever said, what she or he has voted on, that public record, um, oftentimes that personal record and understanding what we should hold up, where there's consistencies, inconsistencies, how to manage that. Um, And I really enjoyed that work. Um, That work is what took me to uh, Hillary Clinton, who I worked for, for in in several different capacities, starting with her 2006 um, Senate reelection in New York and then her 2008 presidential campaign. Um, And then I went with her um, to the State Department. So joined the Obama administration um, on day one and um, was uh, with uh, Secretary Clinton at the State Department. I was in the Office of Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs. Just an extraordinary opportunity. Um, And that is what piqued my interest in communications. One of our tasks in that office was to help coordinate um, messaging with all the embassies around the world. But we also, we were the people to people diplomacy, um, how to facilitate better conversation between the people of um, of our country and the people of Pakistan, for instance, um, using cultural programs and education programs as a way to share and learn from each other and, and bring global communities together. And yeah, just a really uh, an experience of a lifetime for sure. I went, uh, I wasn't really sure what to do with all of my government and political experience. And I was, you know, I was, I was too old to take a junior job. And um, so a lot of my mentors uh, suggested I look at uh, PR and communications as a profession to get into and that my skills would transfer pretty well. Um, they were right, I think. And, uh, um, and so I started that journey at Burst and Marsteller and really enjoyed that agency work. Actually, a lot of a lot of people don't, but I, I loved it. And I, you know, it was a great way to be exposed to all sorts of communications challenges, sometimes for universities, sometimes for small businesses, sometimes for nonprofits, sometimes for Fortune 50 companies, sometimes for individuals. And um, all of that was was really interesting and um, I really 
benefited from working closely with, um, I think, one of the top um, experts in, in our field, and that's Don Baer. And um, he taught me a lot about sort of um, the importance of understanding your audience before you offer a message and how do you kind of connect those dots and um, the kind of range of media available to us and how you identify sort of thought leading journalists um, for those that are delivering opinion and versus how you're digging in with news, all of that. And I, I just loved it. I really loved it. Um, I uh, got into the apparel business <laughs> from <Funny>. there uh, <laughs> and um, was connected to uh, to Ralph Lauren through through a former boss and mentor and um, and Ralph Lauren, uh, David Lauren, actually, um, who led marketing at the time, was looking for somebody who had um Washington, D.C. experience, but also corporate communications experience. And so that's kind of all I had at that point. And um, and so went to, to Ralph Lauren to work on their corporate comms team and, and really enjoyed that, too. I spent most of my time at Ralph Lauren um, understanding the complexities of that business, really digging into supply chain work and um, they are a, a very big uh, and loved uh, fashion brand. And it was really interesting to kind of figure out that gigantic web of a supply chain and understanding where the risk um, was um, or could come from, um, where there were opportunities to do better, um, all of which proved to be very good training for when I got a call from a recruiter. Um, who said an outdoor company in California called Patagonia was looking for somebody with, get this, corporate comms experience, Washington experience, and apparel <laughs> Perfect. experience. Right. And so I, I had uh, accumulated that by then. And um, I had read Let My People Go Surfing, which is our, our founder's book, and was really inspired by his really different approach to running a company and what companies can offer. And um, and so that's my journey. I've been at Patagonia now four years and um, every day is a different challenge, uh, but it's a ton of fun. And um, I I just feel incredibly blessed to, to be a part of such a, a special company um, that really is doing great and important work and selling really good products. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, I'm surrounded by the best and, and that's, it's been, it's been amazing. It, briefly, who is Patagonia? When you, when you meet a friend and they barely know them, they should. Um, how do you explain who is Patagonia and, you know, what are their values? And then I'd love, maybe you have a favorite story. Quite simply, we're, we're a company that does things really differently. Um, uh, we make really quality, durable um, apparel and some equipment to facilitate getting people outside to explore wild places. Um, that's, that's who we are. We are, um, I, when I think about... Um, some of the words maybe to describe um, our, our company, I think about um, we are sort of the ultimate purpose-driven company, uh, mission-led. We are really bold um, and we are unconventional. Um, and and I think we, we really it, uh, capture all three all the time in the work that we do, whether that's um, building product or protecting um, public lands or advocating for strength and climate policies. Um, our approach is totally unconventional. It's always bold. Um, and it is driven by our mission, which is we're in business to save our home planet. I want to get into Yvonne a bit because, you know, in 73, you know, and I was so involved in the outdoor active industry. He was a larger than life, but he was also humble and he is still deeply engaged 
And so, you know, what's it like being with him? And, you, you know, you've gone through a CEO transition of, you know, brilliant. Rose was a brilliant. I was when I read the news feed, she was retiring. I was like, oh, no, but I'm sure that Ryan's going to be great. But so talk to me about uh, Yvonne. Humble is a great word to describe Yvonne. He can be soft spoken, but he's very deliberate um, when he speaks. He's also incredibly consistent. I came across a couple months ago, a profile on him that was written in the, um, I think in 1991. And it could have been written yesterday. (laughs) It was really amazing how consistent he has been um, in what he believes um, in. And, you know, I think that is what provides that foundation of authenticity that's so important to the work that we do. Again, whether we're you're on the product side or on the environmental activism side, we're not in it to be clever. <laughs> it's about it's about making a difference and um And I think, you know, that's really reflected in our mission statement, which was just recently updated, um, I think probably, what, two years ago now. But I think Yvonne wanted to be very, very clear um, internally and externally about what we're about. I think the climate crisis is an existential crisis and it needs all of us. And so he wanted a business that was all about solving for it. Yeah, I want to make it clear to our listeners that you shortened and you made it very precise that Patagonia is in business to save our home planet. And I'm sure you had some hand in helping to cascade that through your ecosystem. What was that like? Because it was a shift a little bit. It was even making it more urgent. It was making it more urgent. That's the purpose in it. And, you know, there was some resistance. Change is hard everywhere. And we loved our old mission statement. And um, but as it was put to me, it was being worn like a second skin and we had outgrown it. Part of how we changed that mission statement internally was making that clear um, that we had outgrown that statement. And um, and externally, it was about reinforcing that urgency and, and bringing that to life. You know, I'll just add that a lot of companies have mission statements and they're important, but I think it's even more important to make sure that your mission statement actually captures your mission. And (laughs) what's, I think, different about Patagonia and our mission statement is that it truly drives every decision that we make. It's very much drives our hiring process. Um, We are looking for people to work at Patagonia who are committed to saving our home planet. Um, It drives the accounting team. They're looking at, you know, who are our business partners and how do they align with our mission statement? Of course, it drives our product team. It drives um, marketing. How are we kind of bringing these stories to life? Not just to raise awareness. It's too late to raise awareness. We need to create action. That's why I opened this with scale. Mm-hmm. Because when I look and I'd love you to talk about it because you have what you're on this trajectory, you know, 2011, don't buy this jacket. You made these bold in your face statements and then one percent for the planet and then your Black Friday commitment where I love the fact where you said, eh, we're going to raise two to four million. You raised ten. But you're scaling things. So ta- it seems you're very also present about doing that, the act in activism. That's right. And we have a a saying at Patagonia, like CTA, call to action. Everything has a call to action in it. It is incredibly rare that we're going to put something out there and not offer a way for our community to act on it. And I think that's really important, um, especially as a communicator, right? There's if you, you know, your communications team should have some values and principles about what, how you talk about things. One of the important principles that we have on the communications team is what is that call to action? If we're going to put something out there, we want people to do something about it. Um, and, and you're right on scale. I, we don't want to go this alone. We can't go this alone. And so, 
we need to figure out if we're going to, if we've made an unlock on, um, on the product side, how can we scale that solution? Um, I think about like our fair trade program. The fair trade program is not good if only Patagonia is participating in it. We need more brands to be deliberate about how they're supporting the factory workers that build your products. And so growing that fair trade program is a really important part of our work on the supply chain team. Now we'd like to take a break and share with you something that interests me this past week. I'd like to share the Dialogue Project. It's dialogueproject.study. It's a research effort to explore what role business can play to help improve civil discourse and reduce polarization, something that we need so much during these times. It is supported by such companies as Google, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Chevron, HP Enterprise, Southwest Airlines, among others, as well as the University of Southern California. This report was based on nearly a year's worth of research in conjunction with Morning Consult. And unfortunately, it provides disturbing new data on Americans' deteriorating ability to debate difficult issues. And, you know, one of my best friends, I was talking about the presidential election, and we started yelling at each other. And, you know, I love this person. And so I I think I better read and go deeper into the Dialogue Project. Um, Again, you can find it on a dialogueproject.study. It was um, driven and created by my friend Bob Feldman, who's an Arthur Page Society friend. And it is absolutely filled with with really, really interesting um, projects and examples that you can adapt for your companies or your organizations to truly talk about really difficult projects today. So enjoy. In your materials, you are intentional about sharing best practices. And I love that as one of your by the numbers, that you have empowered your employees to go out and speak everywhere about culture and operations and product. So where does that, that's very rare. So where does that come from? Is it from Yvonne or Rose or where does it come from? I think it does come from Yvonne, but it's been reinforced by all of our CEOs. And I think they, um, our leadership puts a lot of trust in every single person that works in the company and they trust us to be out there scaling the work that we do and creating that, that impact. And so they do empower not just one or two spokespeople, but people all around the Everyone. company. And also, it's not just to be spokespeople. We find um, ideas at all levels in the company. I mean, the uh, 2016 100% for the Planet Black Friday um, uh, campaign that you mentioned. I heard, from yeah. a more junior member of the marketing team. And, you know, he suggested it quickly we were like heck yeah that's a great idea <laughs> that's great we got a decision quickly and that's how it came to be so um i think but ivan he describes us as an ant colony right everybody knows their <laughs> role and kind of we're all we all work together but um but we all know our role and and people are really empowered uh to do that um in all levels yeah i, I love that you have i saw in your numbers 23 three day weekends <laughs> and that one of your videos is about uh, i guess your your human capital person talking about that you allow people more time to go in the outdoors 
But when they come back, they are much more efficient and effective. Can you talk a little bit about, I'm not sure that you have time to take any of those long weekends, but do you and how does that work? This very much stems from from Yvonne's book, Let My People Go Surfing. And the idea is when the surf is good, get out and surf. <laughs> Come back and then do your work and get your work done. But you can get your work done on your own time. And and that's OK. And um, to be clear, our, our three day weekends are for our headquarters employees. Our, our stores are open every Friday <laughs> um, or at least during normal weeks. And um, but um, for headquarters, yeah, it was an extension of that. You know, when the surf is good, go surf. Well, a lot of our colleagues were located in Ventura, um, California. We are not near the mountains. We are near the ocean. And so for our colleagues that like to get out in the mountains, you know, you, you often need more more than a day. And so that's why we have these three day weekends. And it does make a difference. I think, unfortunately, lately, too many of us have not been able to take advantage of that. I think um, a, a lot of us, a lot of businesses um, around the world, but especially in the States are, you know, still managing through the effects of um, the COVID crisis and preparing um, for another spike and all, all kinds of work just got shuffled around. And so we are still kind of making up for that. So um, and for me personally, I've been spending my extra day um, called 980 Friday off um, helping on voter engagement um, and making sure that, yeah, if I'm volunteering um, for a campaign or um, helping to ensure people vote, um, that's so lately, that's how I've been spending my, my extra days off. I'd love to hear a little bit more about the company's response to COVID and Black Lives Matter um, and both internally for your own people, but also, again, in your scaling ecosystem. We were, um, I believe, one of the first companies to shut down entirely when when the COVID crisis hit this country. Um, and, you know, our CEO at the time, Rose Marcario, I think her feeling was, who are we to say um, if this life is more important? And so it was, you know, shutting down retail, shutting down our distribution center, which meant shutting down our website and shutting down headquarters. And, you know, Rose and our board just, we needed to take a pause and understand what was going on with this health pandemic. We were in a crisis. And so we just needed to take a pause and evaluate. And I think that was absolutely the right decision. Um, we wanted to put um, our employee safety first um, and our community safety first. And that meant shutting down the business and understanding what measures needed to be put in place so that we could reopen safely. The Black Lives Matter movement has been a really important reckoning and far too wake up call for us. And I would encourage all of your listeners to read the acknowledgement statement that we put out, um, gosh, a couple of weeks ago now, um, but it's still on our website. It's our acknowledgement on um, we have not been good anti-racists, and but we are committed to being better. And I think what that movement has done for us, in addition to sort of bringing to the fore that we were not good anti-racists, was um, really, really highlight how overlapping all of these crises are, right? And we are, we are in a climate crisis, let's say it and acknowledge that. We are also in a social justice crisis, and let's say it and acknowledge that. And we are in a health and economic crisis, and all of these are overlapping. And if you're trying to solve for one, that's just not the world that we're living in anymore. And you have to approach them more holistically and you have to you have to solve for the root causes of the problem, not just the symptoms. So what are one other two of the holistic solutions that you are applying to these three interrelated crises? Our bread and butter and our advocacy for nearly 50 years has been around the environmental movement, right, and solving for local environmental challenges. And um, I think it can be tempting um, to 
I'll use one of Yvonne's examples that <laughs> that we are we all would like to save the polar bears and um, the polar bears um, pull at your heartstrings and <laughs> we want to protect them. But if you want to save the polar bear, you have to save the Arctic. And what's destroying the Arctic? Um, it's the extractive industries and. We know that um, it's 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 actually not up for debate. Now, it becomes political when you start to, OK, well, there's a lot of um, economic questions clearly that come from that. We we know that at Patagonia, we still rely on gas, oil to drive our cars. And so you can't do this overnight. But if you want to save those polar bears, you have to save the Arctic. And that means taking a hard look at where you're allowing those extractive industries to destroy the Arctic. And um, and I think where we're seeing this, um, uh, the overlap with the, the, the social crisis that we've ignored for too long, and I'll just stay on my Arctic example here, is indigenous communities in the Arctic and how they um, are affected. I look at the, the Gwich'in in um, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and um, in that community that has depended on this land for thousands of years. And we have to work with them um, if we're going to be a part of that solution. And understanding this um, with them is, is just a huge part of solving for those root root causes. I'm curious about, you know, every um, movement and needs an army. And when I saw you come out with Patagonia Action Works, instantly I knew about the power of that because you're not holding on to it. You're you're a you know, convener. You add. I always like the, the term miracle grow <laughs> to others. So how you, you've had a massive army you've unleashed. So talk a little bit about to our listeners. What is Patagonia Action Works? But then, you know. Has it exceeded your expectations and where is it going? So Patagonia Action Works is um, a platform that we have. Again, encourage your listeners to go to our website and, and check it out. And what it um, at, a, at a high level, what it does is connect our community with the groups that we support that are solving for a lot of these environmental challenges. Um, but it also kind of in the weeds here allows you to. Um, if you're interested in what groups are in your area, you can search by your zip code. If you care about clean water, it allows you to search by, you know, who are the groups tackling clean water. It also, um, and, and then you connect with those groups and you can donate money to them. You can volunteer with them, um, sign petitions. I think one of the really special things about it is say you're a web designer, you can offer your web designer skills to these nonprofits. And, you know, oftentimes these nonprofits are two, three people. And so they could use skills like web designers, graphic artists, things like that. And so um, PR professionals. Um, and so, um, so you can volunteer. And to me, Action Works really typifies why, how our giving, how our philanthropy is quite different than any other company. It is not about just writing checks. Um, the checks are important. Don't get me wrong. And especially in the environmental philanthropic space, um, these groups don't get enough attention. And so, so the checks are important, but it's actually taking it a totally different level, right? We want to create a connection point for our whole community and um, and really dig in deep so we can all be a part of the solution. You're activating an army. We are. Which is just tremendous. Patagonia is such an exciting company to truly dissect that we are creating a second segment. So thanks for joining us for part one and come back next week to learn more about how do you maintain the special ethos that comes from an entrepreneur, a founder such as Yvonne Chouinard and continue to pass that very special secret, secret sauce from CEO to CEO. So join us next week.
When the sun comes shining. We are spiritually and culturally connected to uh, this land. It's like the hair on your head. You pull one hair, you're not going to miss it. And I was scrolling. In every generation, you will always face somebody who represents greed. $150 trillion in mineral value locked up in federally controlled lands. And the dust clouds rolling. If the case can't be made to protect this place, how can you expect to protect anything? People will say, oh, the public land belongs to all the people. Belongs to all the people, I'd like them to tell me which part is mine because I want to sell it. The preponderance of the evidence that I have discovered. The uh, mine is right in front of me. Gotcha. There's an enormous, well-heeled movement to take lands away from the American people. To make vast sums of money for somebody and change our country forever. Representatives of Utah have taken upon themselves to declare war upon us, the Native American tribes. I'd drill in a cemetery if there was oil there. Our public land is not for sale and it's not going anywhere. Don Young does not represent the Gwich'in in our voice. I represent you might, the last You might have, but don't represent the Gwich'in. The largest rollback of federal land protection in U.S. The history. Over public land. They really it's only want power. These people are enemies, and we're going to get your asses, and we know what you're up to, and we're coming for you. There's a lot more people waking up now. We're taking a stand, and we're taking back our home. So ready for the fight, because we're not going to give up. This land that is ours together is a great land. Enjoy new chances for recreational use. To preserve places like this, we must bring to our work a new spirit of respect and cooperation. Without regard to party, to protect them for all of us and for our children. But what's at stake is this enormous common wealth, the American system of public lands. And I don't say we have the right to it. That's not it. You have the right to whatever you're willing to fight for. This land was made.